Welcome to my presentation on robots in the theatre and media. My name is Christoph Bartnik and I'm at the Hitler in Zealand at the University of Canterbury. We will soon live in a society in which we'll have more robots than humans. Already today we have more mobile phones than humans. Isaac Asimov envisioned that the ratio of humans to robots in the future will be somewhere around 20,000 to 1. I'm certainly looking forward to have you know, a lot of robots uh, doing most of my work, in the sense those type of works I don't really like. Um, however, of course, this is still to some degree science fiction. And this is exactly the point. How do you know about robots? If you ask this question to the general public, like non-HRI people, the answer that you usually get is that, well, I know it because I saw it on TV. And this is partly the problem. Most of the knowledge that people have in our society about robots and what their role might be and how to interact with them has been formed by the media. However, there are different types of media and some of them are more interesting than others. The theater is particularly interesting to uh, to us and to HRI, the field of HRI in general, mainly because you need to actually have robots on the stage and all interaction has to be live. This brings the whole interaction scenario much closer to what you would normally have in a um, HRI interaction at home or otherwise. In the movie, you can fake anything you want, however, in a theater production, it actually has to work. However, um, the big disadvantage of a theatre production is that only very few people will have the opportunity to actually see it. Most of you will probably have seen more theatre productions that have been recorded on video and then played back than actual theatre productions themselves. There is even a big discussion within the field of HRI whether video or video recordings of robots can actually be uh, appropriately be used as a replacement for robots. So instead of actually interacting with a robot right in front of you, you would interact with a video recording of a robot. Now, the, in this study, uh, what I did is to look at how the media um, communicates about robots and what are the stereotypes and issues raised. Because these issues and stereotypes are what forms the knowledge of the people when they first interact with robots. When we bring people into a laboratory and they for the first time have a chance to interact with an actual robot, their interaction is based upon the previous knowledge that has been formed by the media. Now of course it is quite impossible to talk about all the robots uh, that have been described uh, in the media, in all the books, in all the films, and in all the theatre productions. So, to that end, uh, we have to admit that uh, we have to make a selection, and that the conclusions that I draw on this are, of course, a personal interpretation. It is certainly not a scientific fact. Now, I believe that theatre can be a role model for human robot interaction. Actually, a lot of HRI studies are very much like theater. Very often you have an experimenter behind the curtain who would actually control the behavior of the robot. This is necessary due to the limitations of artificial intelligence and speech recognition. Robots these days cannot easily interact with humans. They do not understand what they say and very often the interaction is so complex that it really does require a human brain to act appropriately. Now this is actually a form of a mild deception. You put the robot in front of the people, make them believe that this robot is actually smart and it does understand, whereas actually there's a human in the back. The situation can also be compared to a form of stand-up comedian type of performance. You 
Then we take a participant out of their normal environment, put them up on the stage in front of the robot, and suddenly they have to act. This does remind me too very much to some busker performances where people actually take volunteers out of the audience and start to interact with them. So as you can see, there certainly is a relationship between the theater and many studies that have been performed in HRI. Now, when we look back at the history of robotics, uh, Karl Kapczak uh, probably termed the term robot uh, from his theater play, Russell's Universal Robots, back in 1920. However, later on, he acknowledged that his play was actually a variation of a much older theme called the Golden Theme from the Jewish folklore. Nevertheless, it is amazing that we actually still have some photographs of that performance. Now, there are a couple of myths that do reappear in the theater and in the media over and over again, and Rossum's Universal Robots is no exception. One of the myths is that robots want to be like us. And we have, for example, Mr. Data from the series Star Trek. He looks very human and his only purpose in life seems to be that he wants to be more and more like a human. Never quite explain why he wants to be a little more like a human, but that's his motivation. When we look at the movie AI from Steven Spielberg from the year 2001, uh, the main character wants to be a real boy, and that is actually his life's work. We have the Bicentical Man, based on an original story of Isaac Asimov, uh, played by Robin, uh, Robin Williams. And again, you have a robot that spends years over years becoming more like a human, exchanging his metal appearance to that of a human, even arguing or in court to be considered uh, uh, a human being and even sacrificing himself because in order to be accepted as a full member of society he has to accept mortality and he does I don't know why you even have androids which do not even consider themselves as being uh, robots they believe themselves to be humans Rachel from the movie Blade Runner is such a case the engineers planted some artificial memory in her brain, and she honestly believes that she is human. Now, why would we do this? Why do we go on and having all these robots wanting to be like us? And in my perception, this has is a form of flattery. We flatter ourselves. There's nothing better in the universe than to be a human. And if you have a robot that is already stronger and smarter in many respects, there has to be something to maintain our superiority, and that essentially is, is the essence of human being. And this is what the robots, robots try to uh, approach. Now, this is a movie excerpt from the movie um, um, AI. The responsibility is that you will enjoy that method. As he just said, in the beginning, didn't Adam create, or did, did God not create Adam to love him? It is a fundamental question, and that leads me to the second conclusion about why we want robots to be like us. We want to be creators. We want to create beings in our own image. There is also a potentially good engineering reason to this, other than complete vanity, and that is that to be able to uh, create something that is like you, you have to understand how it works. So by creating robots that are like us, we do actually have to understand how we ourselves work. I've argued before that uh, this goal towards creating robots that are like us um, it's not necessarily the best way to progress our society. As a matter of fact, I think it is more important that we have children and that we raise our children rather than creating robots in our image. 
A second myth that we come across quite often is that all robots in the end will kill, enslave, or rule all humans. Examples are, for example, uh, again from Star Trek. Here we have Mr. Data's brother called Lore. And in contrast to Data, Lore has no ambition to be more like a human. He doesn't really care about humans. He's quite happy and content being what he is. Lore and Data both are physically stronger, have much more computer computational power than humans. Um, so Lore would be something like an independent robot. But as storytelling goes, it has to be that Law then has nothing better to do than to enslave humanity. The reason for that, again, remains to some degree a mystery. But it goes further on. Uh, Philip K. Dick, later on in 1982, again, uh, robots or androids, they come back to Earth and actually kill humans. Possibly the most dramatic and well-known example, the Terminator, in, in all its instantiations. Again, the robots have nothing better to do than, you know, become superior, and when they are superior, they have to go around killing everybody. Battlestar Galactica, same thing. Interesting here, though, is that the um, robots, in this case, in the 2003 series, have dramatically changed their appearance. They have become indistinguishable from humans, which gives the whole question about human-robot interaction a whole new dimension. We also have the Matrix in 1999 and 2003. Again, robots or machines took over the world and enslaved the human, and turning them into batteries. 2004, iRobot, again, an artificial intelligence in collaboration with the robots takes over the world to protect humanity in itself. So why do we do this? Why is it that robots become superior and have nothing better to do than, than to enslave. And the answer to it actually lies in the first myth. We create robots in our image. We imagine them to be like us. And what did humans do when they encounter inferior species? When we look back at the human history, this is what happened. Conquistadors. We go out to the world, we find some natives, and we've got nothing better to do than to enslave and kill them. We declare a whole race to be inferior and gas and kill them. Slavery could only be upheld by the assumption that robots, uh, robots that humans, that some humans are of lesser value. We dehumanize them. And of course, there have been some issues for robots or some rules uh, being proposed. Uh, by uh, science fiction writers, uh, Isaac Asimov, that the three laws of robotics that would protect humanity from this to happen. And here you see an example of uh, what this would be looking like. Now, of course, this is quite a humorous approach on the uh, laws of robotics, but uh, once we're at it, there are actually some books out there that you might want to consult on how to survive the robot uprising, and if you're still quite concerned about the future of humanity, there's also How to Build a Robot Army, Tips for Defending Planet Earth Against Aliens. But coming back to the topic of this talk, I would like to propose a framework that will help to better classify and understand the theatrical and media performances of robots. And there are two factors that I think underlie um, the uh, robots. One is the locus of control. Is the robot controlled 
uh, from the outside of its body, or is the control actually inside of the robot itself? And secondly, is the controlling entity actually a human or the robot itself? And depending on that, you get a quadrant. And I'll go through now one on one uh, for all of them and give you some examples. Let's start with the example where the control is actually inside of the robot, but the current controlling entity is a human. And what you get is a guy in a suit. Uh, here we have uh, the Wizard of Oz, uh, the robot, wearing this hat, an actor that is actually just in a costume of a robot. But of course, there are more sophisticated versions of this. What do you think? What is the suit? Who is in there? For this movie, uh, Silent Running, it's actually um, a lab amputee who is used to fit into the robotic exterior and move the robot. And how many of you know Kenny Baker? Kenny Baker was actually the person who was operating R2-D2. And we also have some other more fun examples of people in a suit pretending to be like robots. But of course, there are also some other fantasies about uh, how people like to be in suit, and particularly in the Japanese uh, uh, culture, you have uh, the idea of being inside of a protective robotic suit. And here you have it, um, a robot that is actually um, enclosing you. Well, I'm not quite sure how uh, a smiling trigger would work, but um, it's still interesting. Now there are other forms. Uh, let's go to where the locus of control is actually outside of the robot, and still it is a human that is controlling it. And what you get then is puppeteering. And some examples of that is uh, Robot Wars, um, a very, very popular uh, television show uh, in the UK and the US where people essentially had remote control vehicles that would battle each other. Um, but there are also other examples, um, such as this one, uh, a dancing uh, together with robots. In this case, we've got some quadcopters that do um, interact uh, with an actor on stage. Um, but um, uh, of course, these quadcopters are being remote controlled. Um, we also have uh, our own example uh, here from the uh, uh, Hitler and Z, um, where we have an actor um, and he's going to perform a haka. Oh, <laughs> 
But there are, of course, also some more serious examples of robot puppeteering. And here's an example of um, um, an event that took place um, in, uh, in the US. And not play. Well, we'll just go on to the next quadrant then. Now, we do have um, some examples of um, where the locus of control is actually inside of the robot, and it is the robot himself. Uh, that actually does control. And here's a very early example, 1939. You see, all I need to do is to speak into this phone, and Electro does exactly what I tell him to do, sometimes. But I don't see why I'm telling Electro's story, but he's perfectly able to tell his own. So let's listen and see what Electro has to say to us today. All right, Electro? Will you tell your story, please? and gentlemen, I'll be very glad to tell my story. I am a smart fellow, as I have a very fine brain of 48 electrical relays. It works just like a telephone switchboard. If I get a wrong number, I can always blame the operator. And by the way, I see a lot of good... Now, this might almost look like it was remote control, but actually it wasn't. It was really that, you know, the robot was triggered by the uh, audio commands, but it could actually only um, sense the number of syllables. And of course, 48 uh, transistors or relays are uh, not necessarily something that you would call particularly smart these days. However, this robot did have one feature that barely any other robot afterwards had, which it was actually able to smoke. Now, there are of course other examples um, of autonomous robots, and uh, here we have uh, a performance by uh, Hiroshi Ishiguro and his robots. <laughs> Now, as we see, this is an interesting uh, approach, and um, we um, uh, now move on to the next quadrant, which is um, uh, robots where locus control is outside, but it's still a robot that controls it. And examples are the presidents of the United States. All of these leaders have one thing in common, one trust. They all accept it. My fellow citizens, no threat can fill me with pleasure. But there are also more interesting ones, like, for example, the Jukebot, which is a robotic arm which uh, performs like a DJ. The robot in this case does, of course, not have intelligence inside, but it will be connected to a computer. But as you can see, this is a very interesting uh, performance. 
But there are also themes that uh, come back over and over again. And they all circle around the similarity or the lack thereof between humans and robots in terms of their mind and their body. So either you can uh, argue that uh, a human or a robot is very much like a human in terms of you know, maybe think the same way or might look like the same, or it might not. This leads us to four different types of themes, and again, I will go through of them to uh, give you some examples. So if you look at an example where the mind and the body is the same, an interesting example is the Logos Foundation in Belgium. Uh, in this robotic performance, the actor and director of the Logos Foundation actually argued that uh, to be on equal grounds with robots, humans need to be naked when they perform with robots. Because robots are naked when they um, act. Um, so this performance tries to highlight the equality between humans and robots. We also have Tufia Harvard from uh, Dune, um, a human that is, um, uh, well, it is actually a human, but he works like a computer. His brain is trained to act like a computer. So this is a rare example where you have a human that is moving closer towards uh, machines and not the other way around. We also have examples where uh, the body of the robot might be very much the same as uh, a human, but that the mind works differently. Um, and an example of this is uh, Mr. Data. Mr. Data certainly looks very much like a human, and later on in the series, he even does actually gain an emotion chip and is able to process emotions. But his body um, actually does not require, for example, or his body, any oxygen, so he can easily walk around in space without a spacesuit. This kind of contrast, then, is actually what makes it all interesting. The same thing was played out with David in the movie, um, um, well, in one of the recent science fiction movies. We also have uh, type 3, where we have the mind being the same, but the body being very different. An example of this is Johnny Five from the movie Short Circuit. Again, you have a robot that clearly is not like a human, uh, but that does have a lot of similarities, can express emotions and so forth. When we look at robots that are both different in terms of human, uh, in terms of mind and body, Something that comes to mind is the Oblivion drone uh, from uh, the movie Oblivion. It doesn't look like a human, doesn't think like a human. So why are we then so obsessed with this similarity between humans and robots? And in my view, every story needs to have a tension, otherwise it will just be boring. And this tension is created through uh, playing out the similarities in terms of mind or body. Let me give you an example. Here you see my beloved two children, and the interesting thing is that when people look at them, and depending on whether you have an Asian background or whether you have a European or Caucasian background, um, you will be able to, uh, to sort of consider them to look like you, but not exactly. Um, I have the pleasure of being married to uh, my beautiful Japanese wife, Aya. And our children are therefore mixed. And it has been shown that children of mixed backgrounds um, have a tendency to be particularly beautiful. Uh, I'm not saying this because I'm proud of my own children, but this is actually a scientific fact. People see themselves in them, but they also see something else in them. And it is this tension that creates the attraction that everybody has to look at them. But talking about attention um, or attraction, um, or the tension that is required to uphold the story, I was recently asked to write a piece um, on the recent UN reports on the usage of autonomous uh, weapon systems. And um, I wrote a quite interesting article, I thought, and gave it over to our media representative here at the university. And he came up with the headline, Autonomous Weapon Systems Will Come From the Air, Not the Ground, UC Robot Expert Says. I did indeed argue that, you know, that the current threat of, of unmanned, unmanned uh, uh, 
robots currently come indeed from the air. We've got all the drones flying over us. But that was not the main point of my article. My article was about the moral responsibility that we have. So in the end, after some negotiation, we've been able to agree on the title Death by Robot, who will be to blame, which I think was a step forward. But still, as you see, it does require, uh, a good story requires attention. And a story where there's no conflict is quite boring. HRI is to some degree like theater. And humans that come to our experiment interact with our robots, have most of the knowledge from the media. And therefore, it is important to understand this media, to understand the preconceptions and ideas that people have about robots when they first interact with robots. Of course, in the future, when robots uh, are more common, and people will have them at home and interact with them every day. Uh, this will become of a lesser importance. But right now, it is very important to understand this. Also, a lot of the interaction that we actually program our robots to, to act out would benefit from the experiments, experience that the field of theater has to offer. Acting like a robot, or just acting, it's hard, and to get it right, it's not easy. And having to formalize this so that you can actually put it into the brains of robots is also not an easy task. So I believe that theater and the media are both very important topics for human-robot interaction. Thank you very much.